the co-op. It's going to be there until the 15th of April, and it's mostly part of the material that we will be sending to the Biennale uh, Architecture in Venice. And today is the first session that we have of a small series of four lectures. Uh, next Tuesday, the 13th of uh, 30th of March, we have Anna Kujane. Uh, this one is going to be in Catalan. Then the Thursday, 8th of April, we also have uh, seven projects of cooperative housing that are happening now here in Barcelona. This one also in Catalan. And then the the last one. Uh, so the last one is going to be the 15th of April with uh, Martino Tatara from the studio Dogma. And this one is going to be in English. Today uh, we have Ilka Ruby. She's a Berlin based publisher and curator. Uh, together with her partner Andrea Ruby, she founded Textville first, an office for architectural communication. And then in 2008, uh, Ruby Press, which is a publishing house uh, that focuses on architecture. And they published dozens of uh, interesting books that you can see in her website. She was trained as an architect and Ilka Ruby as an architectural historian, right? I think it's this way. <laughs> uh, and then they work simultaneously as uh, critics, curators, moderators, publishers and teachers, uh, especially communicating architecture to a broader audience. They've been creating different uh, exhibitions, especially like the Road like a Caton and Vassal to Roi Le Petre in the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt. And also like the pavilion of uh, representing uh, Montenegro in the Architecture Biennale in Venice in 2014. But we met uh, Ilka, we, can, we came in contact with uh, Ilka and Andrea Roby for the exhibition Together, the New Architecture of Collective that was held first at the Vitra Museum in 2017 and then has been traveling in many other places. Now it's in Hamburg, I think. Uh, and also for those who could not uh, go, like me, uh, they also publish a very nice book with the same title that uh, we highly recommend you. So we will have uh, Ilka talking for almost an hour more or less, and then we have time for questions. So uh, I invite you to uh, write your questions at the chat in YouTube, and I will be collecting them and, and bring it to Ilka at the end of, of the presentation. So thank you very much, Ilka, for uh, accepting our invitation. And please, uh, we hear you. OK, so thank you for inviting me. I will start now to share my screen, and I hope this works. Um, so let me know if you. Um, yeah. Yeah. OK, so you should see yeah. my screen. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for, for inviting me. I will at the end of the lecture, I will also show you some of the some images from the uh, exhibition that is now in Hamburg, the Together exhibition that unfortunately had to close again due to the pandemic. Um, but yeah, so at least you can you can have a, a short kind of uh, view inside. Um, from social housing to collective housing is the title of my lecture and <clears throat> We have seen over the past decade a uh, growing social movement, uh, fostering collectivity, sharing and participation. And this paradigm shift in social values can also be seen in architecture, where in recent years increasingly innovative collective housing projects have emerged. And uh, Switzerland being one of the, the countries on uh, the forefront of this development, but also in other countries like Austria, Germany, Spain, Japan, we find uh, many of those collective housing projects. And many of them have been conceived and realized in bottom-up initiatives um, with close involvement uh, with, of architects. But I want to start with um, all this with a look back into history um, because the way we live today, which is so normative for us, this kind of two generation family structure. Um, this is historically 
an anomaly. So for centuries, people lived and also worked in multi-generational households. For economic and social reasons, it was very natural for people to form communities to care for each other. And in pre-modern times, managing the tasks of earning a living, raising children, caring for the elderly was often divided among three or more generations. And what we see here is the so-called, it's one of those examples of housing of that um, pre-modern times, the so-called hallway house that was developed in northern part of Germany. It was a house for, um, for trading, trade family. And the main characteristic is, of course, this big hallway that we can see in the photo and also in the in these kind of axonometry, um, which was often extending over two floors and it occupied a considerable part of the building and it served um, at the same time as the main living and working space. Um, and there was a storage above and below you can see this little elevator and the bedrooms were in the um, back, back part of the building. So these houses, and um, I mean, there are, this is only one example. There are many others, also farmhouses of these times, for example, had these uh, really th these social units um, of, of life, uh, living and working. Um, so the living room was often the workshop and thus there was no separation of these two things. And only with industrialization in the 19th century, then led to a separation of living and working and these this kind of rapid growth of cities. Um, and of course, also with these kind of rapid growth, there, there came a lot of problems. Um, so as we can see here in this image, um, so that after World War I, around 1920, housing programs emerged to solve the, the housing problems of that time, which was housing shortage, overcrowded apartments, and very unhealthy living conditions. And against the backdrop of those conditions, the aim was to provide affordable, healthy housing um, for as many people as possible. Then the so-called um, noise bound, so new building, um, was developed by architects and city planners, like, for example, Ernst May, and they promoted equal access to light, air, and sun for all the inhabitants. And while he was, Ernst May, where he was um, head of uh, the, the planning department in, in Frankfurt, uh, he created 15,000 housing units in five years, which, which was a lot for that time. We see here one, the so-called zigzag settlement in Frankfurt. Um, this settlement also had a communal house with a washing machine, a central radio system, a kindergarten, a library, and a brand of the welfare office. And there was also free space that could be managed and used by the tenants themselves. And in these kind of interior uh, zigzag um, space, so the, this uh, courtyard space, um, there were uh, playgrounds uh, for kids and a kid's pool and, and these kind of gardens where people could grow their vegetables. Um, many of the projects that were designed or planned at that time um, they had also bigger uh, collective functions, like uh, really like like cultural uh, institutions that would serve popular education, such as concert halls or uh, larger um, libraries and and so on. But um, for financial reasons, none of those bigger um, collective amenities were realized, unfortunately. And this already indicates a little bit uh, a problem of, of social housing. And by social housing, I mean, I, I uh, refer to these kind of uh, subsidized uh, housing programs by the state to provide affordable housing. Um, and, and this problem became even more uh, severe after World War II, where, of course, there was again a huge high housing shortage. Um, 
because of destruction of the war and then also later, of course, um, many refugees um, that came to Germany and then during the economic boom, um, also later on many uh, foreign workers and, and migrated to Germany. So there was again um, a housing shortage and then these kind of the, the housing, social housing state program that was developed in many ways built upon the ideas of these kind of, of this kind of new building and modernism from the 20s. But by now the conditions had completely changed and there were some inherent structural problems that were responsible that projects, uh, many projects of social housing um, were doomed to fail in many cases. So I will go through some of the the reasons why that was the case. Um, so one was is the uh, idea of the uh, existence minimum, as we say in Germany, so the flat for the subsistence level. Um, there was the idea to provide as many people with a minimum of what was considered necessary for a decent life. And this led to very standardized, very small apartments. As we can see here, some examples. <clears throat> and these sizes developed as a minimum that must not be fallen below, then became a kind of norm that later was never questioned or exceeded anymore. So very standardized, very small apartments that which and, and this standard for a very long time was never questioned. And if we look a little bit what it what it means, if we see here a standard ground plan like three rooms, a kitchen around 65 uh, square meters. And if we compare that um, to, the, to, to the flat for the existence maximum, like Mies van der Rohe's uh, Villa Tugendhat, for example, this is the ground plan of this villa. We can see that this um, minim minimum apartment just fits in the library of this. So these are the big, these kind of the range of, of maximum and minimum we are talking here about. Um, yeah, this is the space basically of, that would be occupied by this uh, three um, room apartment. Uh, another problem that are of social housing, um, post-war social housing was it was very monofunctional. Um, the developments uh, provided housing, but not enough other functions like shopping, schools or leisure facilities. We see here uh, um, some um, development from Berlin called Märkisches Quarter for up to 50,000 residents, 17,000 apartments. And so this is not only a neighborhood as it, um, like many of the um, projects before um, World War II in the 20s, but this is really a, a city within a, in, in the city. So the scale is kind of, it's really upscaled a lot. And initially the plan, of course, contained many community and social facilities here, like schools and daycare centers, stores, healthcare, culture, and so on. However, the number of residents increased much faster than the infrastructure could be built. So in the end, uh, we see that many buildings uh, were filled with apartments all the way down to the ground floor. Um, there were not enough shops, not enough schools, uh, which made the street space a very unurban place. And all this led to the fact that the project soon got a very bad reputation because it was very monofunctional. Plus it was also very poorly connected to the city, which is the next flaw Many of those projects uh, share, they, are, um, they were built as satellite towns outside of cities which had bad or no public infrastructure connecting them with the city. So he's, we see here an image from Gellerup. Uh, this is the biggest housing estate in Denmark. Now by public transport half an hour outside of Aarhus. Um, but when it was built, it was very bad connected. And Another problem, they were very homogeneous, these neighborhoods. 
So they were developed only for low income groups, um, which means these settlements um, were socially and economically very um, uh, yeah, homogeneous. For example, Gallerup, uh, we've seen before, is not only the biggest housing estate in Denmark, it's also the poorest neighborhood. And due to the failure of integration policies, uh, the percentage of migrants living in social housing settlements is often way above the average, leading also often to ethnically homogeneous neighborhoods. And some of the problems um, could not have been anticipated when social housing emerged, but all these problems are the reason that projects of social housing turned into a social powder keg sometimes with often very like ghetto-like uh, conditions. And we see here the images in, in France in to the, from 2005, where the Bonlieu riots started and that then spread um, also over other cities in France. And the only solution politicians would come up with at, some, at that point was to demolish those settlements. Um, so in France, there is the so-called urban renewal program, uh, which until today demolished more than 150,000 social housing units to replace them with new buildings. But although it became clear by now that the social problems in the Bonlieu neighborhoods are not solved by this approach, the program is continued. So demolishing buildings that are needed and building a new is, of course, a disaster in many uh, respects uh, from an ecological point of view, because it produces waste and emissions, but also from a social point of view. And plus, the number of the newly built apartments uh, was lower than the number of destroyed apartments. And since the new buildings were also low rise buildings, they occupied and consumed more uh, ground space. So. This situation um, was uh, th this was the situation when when uh, architects uh, Lacaton Vassal together with Frederic Druyot um, made this kind of study plus um, and this study is a kind of counter proposal. Uh, so they said this urban renewal program of France is in the first place a de demolition program and they showed how it is possible to keep these buildings but to modernize and enlarge them with winter gardens and balconies. Um, plus they also proposed to, to add additional services and collective, collective functions to the lower floors. So this would be one of those buildings that uh, would be due to demolishing, uh, to be demolished. And they said, okay, but we can, we can use the money instead of demolishing and building new, we can transform this building and we can create something like this. And they also proved in their study that all this would cost less money than the demolishing and building a new. Um, this was a, a study where they kind of proved that and um, Luckily, they were then able to realize their first project uh, with this approach, which is the um, Tour Bois le Prêtre in Paris, and that was 2011. So it's a housing tower with about 100 apartments. And you see the before and the after um, image of that project. Um, so what did they do? Um, they took away the existing facade and they replaced the facade by a winter garden and a balcony. They, uh, they added these kind of floor to ceiling um, windows and, and these thermal curtains. So this winter garden unit that is added to the building is, uh, is not heated. It's a kind of buffer zone. Um, that has an indoor outdoor a mixture between indoor and outdoor climate and but it also since it's this kind of uh, buffer thermal buffer to the building it also reduces the heating costs of the building. Um, all this 
was done while the building was fully occupied. So it was the people could stay within the building. Um, when the facade was taken away, it was uh, this kind of temporary facade. It was closed with this temporary facade that you see here. And then these elements, uh, the floor slabs for the winter gardens and the balconies were built from a bottom to top. And, uh, and once uh, the new facades were built, the, these kind of temporary facades um, of the building were taken away. So all the people who lived in the building could stay in the building and they didn't have to uh, move out. So also all the kind of social um, fabric that existed within the building, the neighborhoods and so on could, um, wasn't, were not destroyed. Um, they also talked to everyone in the building and ask, okay, is your apartment, does it still fit you? Uh, or would you like to have a bigger or a smaller apartment? So, and there were a couple of cases where an apartment was um, too big because the kids have, had, have moved out, but then other apartments were too small because people got more kids. So they also did this internal uh, exchange within the building that people kind of could move into smaller or bigger apartments that would fit them better. Um, another thing they did, we see here the ground plan and we see this kind of the blue parts are the new winter gardens and the, and the balconies that are not heated. And then they also found out that there's a little bit of a possibility to add more living space, which is the two green rooms. So by adding those uh, to the building, and these are heated rooms connected uh, to, to these uh, corner apartments, and by adding these rooms, they also created a wider uh, variety of apartments. So before, there, there were a very small variety of apartments, and they had a much uh, bigger variety afterwards. So there was some kind of internal, uh, um, yeah, in, internal, uh, corrections as well and they also made the uh, the circulation easier and uh, the ground floor so this is uh, the space with these kind of winter gardens that were added and the balconies with a nice view over paris so a space that looked like this before then became something like this or this kind of space could turn into, into this space. And um, the second and way larger project they were able to, to realize is the transformation of 530 units in City du Grand Parc in Bordeaux. And this time they collaborated with Christophe Houtin from Bordeaux. And we see here the, how the buildings looked before and that's how it is now. And again, they used the same principle. So we see here the ground plan, and this time it's to one side. It, of course, this is only a small portion of this long building, but you can see they added these kind of, again, this kind of winter gardens. They took away parts of the facade, they added the winter garden, and they added the balcony. And so we we have this kind of before and after when we look from inside um, towards the winter garden to the outside. And this is the, these are these winter garden spaces that are really quite big and it makes, it's, it's amazing when you see what kind of difference it makes when, when you have this kind of extra space. Um, also here, the inhabitants could stay inside the building. They didn't have to move out. It was done, the, the whole, uh, construction took place while the building was fully occupied. So with their projects, Lakato Vassal and Druyo proved that the building could be substantially enlarged and improved and all this by using less money that it would have been cost to demolish, demolish and rebuild the units. But uh, also what they couldn't implement, uh, that was the idea of additional collective 
uh, functions on the ground floor of the buildings. Because, I mean, they didn't exist before and there was just not much, there was no space that uh, that could be uh, transformed into these kind of collective uh, functions. So why is this so difficult to, to achieve? And probably because it is one of the initial failures of social housing that uh, social housing did only financially support housing functions, but no other collective functions. And this problem became very manifest, for example, in the Unité by Le Corbusier. So we see here the, the project built in Marseille, and that had um, shops and a cafe, hotel rooms and a laundry on level seven and eight, as we see here. And there was on the rooftop, there was the kindergarten, open air, theater and sport facilities. And this was open for, for to anyone. What we see here is the same building, more or less, that was built in Berlin um, 10 years later for the Building Expo Interbau. But here, all the public functions were dismissed because this building was realized with social housing funds. And so those funds would not provide subsidies for any other function but housing. So a social housing, which doesn't allow for spaces where people can meet and spend time and do things together, uh, in the end, isn't so social anymore. Um, but of course, there are also positive, a lot of positive uh, examples. For example, one of them is Alt Erla in Vienna. This is also a satellite city in the south of Vienna. Um, it, it houses around 9,000 people. And it's one of the projects in Vienna with the highest housing satisfaction among its inhabitants. And, and the reason why uh, that there are all kinds of public amenities, such as schools, kindergartens, medical center, shops, parks, um, but also there are many collective spaces. There are these uh, pools and saunas on the roofs and also inside the buildings. And there are uh, these kind of indoor spaces that in the small section, these kind of greenish yellows in the middle of the building, where the building at the bottom gets wider. Inside there are these, uh, these spaces that are used by more than 30 clubs of the inhabitants. Um, so they were handed over to the inhabitants and the inhabitants could appropriate these spaces and they were they are used for a couple of clubs. And I, I show you a couple of images by artist uh, photographer uh, who who made a, a research on those uh, spaces, Sarah Pfeiffer. And you can see how, how differently they are used. So there are these kind of playgrounds, for example. But then of course, ping pong, some kind of uh, car thing, dancing, shooting ranch, different kinds of sports, kind of craft. Um, there's a Freddie Quinn museum, dancing for adults, kind of model plane club. Yeah. So there's there's so much going on, and uh, which it's very interesting that when you look at these spaces, they are not really attractive, one would say, in terms of spatial qualities. For example, they don't have natural light or natural ventilation, but they provide a space that can be appropriated by the users and a space where the inhabitants, in a way, can live their dreams, and so. Affordable housing, of course, is very important to keep our cities livable, but it would be a mistake to only focus on housing. So after all, housing is always urban development, and we do not need 
only affordable housing in the city. We also need public functions and spaces where we can come together as a community and where we can see ourselves as part of a larger whole. And many people today are not satisfied with what the real estate market has to offer here. And they have become active themselves and have shown in a kind of bottom up urban development, how an inclusive city for all and by all would be possible. And one of the pilot projects of this kind of self empowerment is the so called coffin factory in Vienna that was built on a former site of a coffin factory. And it was developed by a group of people. Um, they started the project because they wanted to live together differently with many shared facilities like a music club, a restaurant, a pool, a kindergarten, seminar spaces and so on. And they wanted to, to do this within the city. So they didn't want to move out of the city, but they wanted to stay within the city. And this is the ground plan of that project. So I can explain you a little bit uh, what you see. It's You can see that it kind of connects uh, and at some point to the, to, the, to the street, but then there is this kind of courtyard situation and all the, the yellowish orange, uh, this is housing. This is uh, the, the ground floor. Um, there are 80 to 100 residential units. They are built on a two story. Uh, all of them are over a uh, two story. Um, and the unit is the, the ground flo floor unit is about 45 square meters. And the units can be added as desired and are accessed via an outdoor um, circulation arcade. Um, there are private units and shared apartments for, for assisted living. These are the darker ones, um, more on the top. Um, then you, you see the green and spaces that are uh, public facilities. So there's a restaurant and a coffee house. Um, there are seminar rooms, a daycare center, an event hall with a rehearsal room that also becomes a jazz club in the evenings uh, with a very good uh, program. And there's, um, in addition, there's also a swimming uh, pool with a sauna, a Turkish bath, and various workshops. This is the um, the basement of that building. The blue part is the the big blue part is the the pool, and the green part is the jazz club, and the smaller spaces are the workshops. So, how did they realize all that? Um, initially, the group had the idea to apply for funding for social housing, but that but then they had to learn that social housing would not have uh, would only fund the housing, but no collective facilities. Um, so in the end, that wasn't what they wanted. Um, the solution was that they redefined their project from a housing project into a dormitory. So because in a dormitory, communal facilities are subsidized and in dormitories, you need um, collective rooms like a collective kitchen, collective bathrooms and so on. So the initiators of the project founded an association for integrative living because the users included very different population groups such as elderly people, students, um, people with disabilities, migrants, and so on. And all these groups usually are accommodated in separate dormitories. Um, but here in the coffin factory, they said, okay, all, we bring all these groups together in one dormitory. And thus, so we can have these kind of collective facilities we desire, and we can realize them because they are subsidized. So. The collective kitchen, which is the, what is the collective kitchen in a dormitory, became the restaurant. And the collective music room um, became the jazz club. And the collective or the communal showers became the swimming pool. So it was a kind of 
relabel, re, relabeling, let's say, and, uh, and, and a twist um, to, to make all these kind of functions they were eager to have um, possible. And another advantage was that with the dormitory, you don't have to provide parking. So where usually would have been the underground parking now could be the, the swimming pool. And these uh, facilities are open are not only for the inhabitants of that project, but they are open to the city. So that it's, it's really, for example, for the swimming pool, you can become member of this kind of club, swimming club. Uh, when you live in the neighborhood and then you uh, get the key and then you can use the, the pool whenever you want to use it. Um, this project was for many years uh, a kind of a key project um, many architects refer to, but only recently, starting in Switzerland, there were a number of new collective housing projects developed by newly founded housing cooperatives that took the idea of collective living even further. And one of the projects is Kalkbreite um, by Müller Sigrist in Zurich. It's, uh, it's, it's, I will use this uh, project as an example to show how those new cooperatives implemented their ideas of living together and how they very consciously avoided the, the four mistakes I identified earlier on that many social housing projects repeated again and again. So instead of a existence minimum, there is a, a maximum. Um, what does this mean? That doesn't mean that the apartments in the, in the building are very huge, uh, not at all. In fact, the average living space per person in these apartments is below the average living space per person in Switzerland. So in that project, there are per person uh, 33 square meters. And compared to the average in Switzerland, this is, uh, which is 46 square meters per person. So this is way, way lower. Um, but in addition, the project provides a huge amount of facilities that the inhabitants share. So although the private spaces uh, are smaller than average, the space one could actually use is much bigger and the variety of facilities is much richer. Um, what we see in the Kalkbreite is a very differentiated uh, way of, of, of use collective spaces. So there are spaces that could only um, be used um, by people living together. Uh, in one flat, um, like in a so-called cluster apartment. I will come back to this later, more in detail. Um, but then there's, that was, for example, the, the kitchen space of one of those cluster apartments. But then there are spaces that are shared by all the inhabitants of the project. For example, this kind of lobby, it's the lobby space, the entrance space of the, of the building. There's a library attached to this. Um, where people bring their books that they don't want to read anymore. Um, there's this, uh, there are these washing uh, machines uh, that can be used so you don't have to have a washing machine in your apartment. Um, there's the, this kind of cafe space for the inhabitants. And there's also a canteen with a cook. Um, and with your, uh, yeah, with your rent, you can also buy this kind of meal plan where you then uh, are able to to go to the restaurant and have a have dinner every night uh, if if you want. Um, this kitchen is also used for it also cooks for the kindergarten that is uh, that is also in in, in this project. Um, instead of monofunctional. These spaces are multifunctional. Um, we see here the uh, a section of the building and all the red spaces. These uh, are, are the spaces that are non-residential use um, in the in in the lower part of the building. This is around forty percent um, of the space, 
And these are spaces like, uh, of course, cafes and shops. Um, you can you can see with when when you go up these kind of stairs, you end up on this kind of uh, elevated um, playground and courtyard, which is also open to the public. A kindergarten and playgrounds. Um, there's a packaging free supermarket. There's a cinema. Um, there are bars, shops, offices, medical services, and so on. Um, instead of being disconnected, it's it's very, very urban. In fact, it occupies um, a space that was before underused in the city because it, the whole project is built on an existing tram depot. And this, uh, so the tram depot still exists. So you see this kind of, uh, this big uh, gate where trams would um, go into the building to be parked. And uh, because it's so well connected, uh, it's also private cars are also not necessary. And they are also not allowed here. So with signing your lease, the inhabitants commit to not have a car. And this was a deal the, the, they could do with the city because of that, okay, our inhabitants commit to not having a car and by this we don't have to provide parking space. Um, and then in, they are of course not homogeneous but very heterogeneous. We can see here an overview of the different ground plans of the Kalkbreite, so instead of very standardized ground plans, plans catering only to the traditional family model of parents with kids, um, this project offers a variety of very different ground plans for all kind of constellations of living together. So, of course, singles, couples, families, um, single parents with kids, patchwork families, flat sharing communities, and so on. And one new ground typology is this so-called cluster apartment, which I would like to explain a little bit more in detail now. And for this, I go to another project also in Zurich, which is called Mehr als Wohnen, than Housing. Um, this is a huge project uh, consisting of, you see here, it's, it's a whole neighborhood um, that was built. And Many of those uh, pro, um, buildings, they have these kind of cluster um, apartments. So how does the cluster apartment work? Um, this is a shared flat um, with five to ten individual units. But in contrast to conventional shared flats where each inhabitant got one room plus there's a shared kitchen and a shared bathroom and maybe a shared living room, a cluster apartment provides a couple of mini apartments within the flat. So these mini apartments consist of one or two rooms plus a small bathroom plus a small kitchen. And in this ground plan we see here, these are the, the kind of gray um, uh, rooms. You can see this, it's one or two rooms and you see there's a small kitchen, there's a small bathroom. Um, and all these kind of mini apartments, I call them, they group are grouped together um, and, and attached to very large uh, shared rooms like big living room, big kitchen. And um, so there's, uh, you can, uh, this kind of collectivity is an option here. It's not whenever you, you don't feel like, oh, no, I, I don't, I, I need a little bit more privacy. You can always kind of be in your, in your private room. You don't have to share. You, you, it's an option. You, you can, you can have your, you have your own little bathroom. You can even have your coffee in the morning if you're not feeling social enough to have the coffee with your um, co-inhabitants. Uh, So how does this look? It looks like this. These are these kind of shared rooms. Let me see here, like a big kitchen with a big table. 
and of course also outdoor spaces and, and terraces. So this means you can be on your own, you can have your own private bathroom, kitchen, but you can also enjoy company um, when you want. And since the traditional family model is, is less and less the norm, Today, we, we really need to come up with new typologies of ground plants um, for living together in constellations that are not family. Um, and especially in the situation, I think the pandemic uh, showed it very well how important it is that we have social contact, that we all need social contact. And in these days, there are more and more people living on their own, elderly people, but also young people. Um, these kind of new ways of, of living together are extremely important and, and healthy for all of us. Plus, if we consider that we will have in the future also probably doing more and more work from home, that means also uh, the workspace as a social space is, is becoming less important. These kind of, uh, and we will have probably more, um, more free time anyway, since robots might take over a lot of uh, the work uh, we at the moment do, so we will have more uh, free time. So it's, I think it's important that we, we get these kind of uh, spaces where we can live together as, as communities and have this kind of social exchange. So this was only a very small uh, selection of collective housing projects that were developed over the past years. And um, I will now go quickly um, go through some of the uh, examples that we um, showed um, in our exhibition and, and give you a little tour of the exhibition um, we did, where we, of course, show a lot more of those uh, housing projects. Um, ah, yeah, there's also, of course, uh, th that's still one of the um, from the um, more than housing, uh, more than living um, project. Uh, also, these uh, the, the circulation spaces are made in a way that uh, there's as much communication as possible. For example, you see these windows between the apartments to the circulation space. So each kind of of these kind of hallways becomes like a little uh, yeah, like a, like a little street. And the apartments like like row houses that have a, also access to this kind of or connection to these kind of spaces. And of course, the the ground floor is um, mostly car free and uh, there are a lot of uh, collective functions in the on the ground floors like shops and workshops and spaces for the uh, community um, where, where people can meet and yeah, use the, and appropriate um, the, the public space. Yeah, this is uh, now the, um, that would be the, the catalog of the uh, exhibition we did uh, together with uh, Swiss architect E.M. Tuen and um, where a lot of those projects are in. We developed this for the Vitra Design Museum and it's basically divided in, in four rooms and each room is dedicated to one topic. And the first room is called Utopia Now. And this is, shows a little bit the history of collective housing projects. So there's this timeline of collective housing projects tracing um, the development back to utopian projects in the 19th and early 20th century over first radical housing cooperatives in the 1920s and various protest movements against housing shortage and real estate speculation in the in the 1960s. And in addition to the timeline, there's also a number of videos showing both historical as well as uh, contemporary footage. Um, the second room is called the city as a public living room. It's um, a fictitious um, city model of 22 contemporary projects, I mean pro existing projects, but of course we brought it together here um, and I, I show you this little uh, movie where you can see how this works. So 
we brought these projects together and we built a city that doesn't exist because these projects are all over the world. But um, to show that it's not the singular project that is important, but it's really important how these projects work together and make city together. Um, because um, it, it's, it's, it's important how the, the, the exchange from a project and the urban environment works. And that's why we um, presented these models in the way that we show all the collective and shared spaces um, very detailed. So whenever you can look inside the building and you see these kind of people and the furniture, you see, okay, these are collectively um, and shared spaces and all the private spaces, <coughs> sorry, we only um, made with a um, blank white facade. And, <coughs> sorry, by this, you see how these kind of um, projects can work together. <coughs> sorry. And also that these kind of collective spaces are not only <coughs> on the ground floor, <coughs> but also on <coughs> upper floors. <coughs> there was, <coughs> sorry, there was <coughs> also color coding. <coughs> oh God, sorry, I have to drink more. T take your time. <coughs> <clears throat> so the the different colors <clears throat> show the different um, 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 kind of levels of, of uh, privacy and also if these spaces are outdoor, indoor, if they are a green space or a hard space. <clears throat> so that that's the, the different colors here in this project. Then the next project, uh, the next room is called Collective Privacy and here we show one of those cluster apartments and <clears throat> the idea was that we do a one-to-one -one model mock-up of one of those cluster apartments to, to really show, okay, what are the sizes of these apartments, what does it really mean, how big is the collective space, how are the, the private spaces connected to it. So we built this kind of apartment and you can see the ground plan, but our cluster apartment was too big for the exhibition exhibition space. Everything that is kind of in within these kind of black um, walls, these are the walls of the of of the actually uh, exhibition space. So you can see some of the um, some of the space didn't fit. So we had to kind of, we, we could only build a part of it, but all the collective space is completely um, um, built so that you can get an idea of the size of this kind of collective space. With this kind of big kitchen table. And we also um, have a couple of, yeah, our quotes by people why they why it's nice for them to uh, to live together and and they range from very different i mean some are very kind of are very pragmatic in a way also they well it's it's i could never uh, afford this kind of espresso machine and it's great that we can share that um here you see this kind of living room and to the right, this open door, this would be then the entrance to one of those uh, smaller mini apartments and we can go into one of those. So when we enter, there's this very small hallway to the right, there's a bathroom, um, there's the kitchen and um, a living room, uh, a bedroom. And so this would be the kitchen of that space small kitchen space, the bedroom, and to the left there would be another room, uh, another bedroom for uh, a kid, kid's room. So we, we, you see these kind of, uh, to, to 
give the idea of how, how you would have a kind of view out of these, uh, because it, it's a totally uh, yeah, enclosed uh, museum space. We, we did these kind of wallpapers with views to the outside to, to give a little bit the impression, okay, there's, there's an outside to it. So this was really to, so that people get an idea, okay, what, how does it feel to, to be in one of those uh, cluster apartments? There were some movies and there were also some, um, you saw before on the walls, there were uh, photos by photographer Daniel Burchardt. He visited some of the projects and made her, uh, yeah, spent some time with the inhabitants. For example, here a project in Japan and he, he kind of showed how these projects are in, in daily life. And we used some of the some of his photos, of course, in the in the catalog, but also um, in in the exhibition itself. And the last room, it's called it it works together. <clears throat> and here we have um, this room is our, from the atmosphere here. From, from the atmosphere, it's like a, like a co-working space. We have a couple of um, five desks and each desk is dedicated to one project. And all these projects are um, realized in very different ways. So there's one project that was uh, realized by a, um, by a cooperative. There is a pro privately uh, um, developed project. There's a, a cooperative together with the pension fund. <coughs> um, there's a, a so-called building group. <coughs> Hold on. And so you get on each table, <coughs> you get this kind of uh, information about who was involved, how long did it take, <coughs> and, and um, yeah what did it cost and so on. <clears throat> yeah, that's basically it. And um, yeah, sorry for my, my voice that at some point <laughs> would not work anymore. But uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm finished and uh, yeah, I hope you, you enjoyed and I'm, I'm yeah, happy to answer questions. And I will probably stop now the um, screen sharing, right? Perfect. Thank you, Ilka. Okay. Uh, pl please take a candy or something. Yeah, I didn't have one here otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> we give you some minutes to recover while we... Yeah make the questions. Um, okay. uh, so the people who are listening to us in YouTube, please uh, use the chat if you want to make any question. Uh, we have one from Eliseu uh, Arufat, but maybe first, oh, thank you. I wanted to comment that um, I found some of the ideas that, that you share with us very interesting and, and resonating with many things happening here, no? And one, I didn't know about the Sark Fabric, uh, I knew about the project, but I didn't know on this detail that they had to label themselves as dorms uh, in order yeah. to get the subsidy for the collective spaces, because this is something that happened to us the same in the case of La Borda, all the collective spaces didn't receive a subsidy. Here, uh, it goes by square meters, so the square meters of the units did get the subsidy, but not the collective spaces. Mm. And now in Catalonia, they just passed a new uh, legislation, new rule on uh, something that it's called uh, ayotjaments, so similar to dorms or, or to uh, hosting space. So you can make smaller units and then if they have communal spaces, uh, but the, the good part is that these communal spaces count as a 
house mm. surface, no? And I, I found very interesting all this debate from the very beginning, no? from the 20s and 30s, like when they discard um, the, the social aspect of uh, the community aspect of so, of housing, no? And, uh, yeah. and I don't know if you see some changes in that, like the one that, that happened here in, in Catalonia. I don't know if, the, for instance, in Germany, with all this new wave of Baugruppen and, and mid houses syndicates, so on, if they are also pushing for a regulation change so that these spaces are also included, for instance. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's really difficult to to change existing laws, but uh, also in Germany there are um, I mean, it's it's not happening too often, but there is also a slow rethinking of this, and um, because of projects that, uh, yeah, that realized these kind of um, collective spaces, and it's it's getting more and more. For example, that you, if if the city gives away or makes a kind of competition, it's not only given given to the uh, to the one who would build the the most uh, apartments for the cheapest price, but you really you can also um, uh, apply with a concept and kind of this kind of idea of sharing facilities and and, and living together and collective functions is it's becoming more and more um, important here, and, and people are also pushing to to shift these kind of standards and and open it up and and make it possible. Yeah. So it, it's more taken into consideration in the competition moment, no? Like in, yeah, in, in it's, the it's... competition moment. But it, it needs a kind of a certain, of course, it always needs a... Uh, um, yeah, if the city or so, you, you really need the, the city who, a city that kind of appreciates and, and understands that this is really a, um, an, an advantage. And it's not only for the people who live there, but it's an advantage for the whole, maybe for the neighborhood and for the whole city. And this is something important that needs to be um, pushed. And of mm. course, if, if it's if it's just a private development, um, even private developments, of course, also uh, notice that this is it's not a bad idea to have collective functions. But this is, of course, then on an, on another level. Uh, it's often kind of very high end uh, level where it's more like this kind of um, hotel serviced living um, approach. Um, but um, I think it's it's important that also for affordable housing, not just for luxury housing, where you can offer a lot of shared facilities like a gym or whatever, but also for affordable housing that it's important that there's there are fun, there there are spaces where people can can meet and that they can appropriate for themselves. And I find it very interesting to see these kind of clubs in Alt Erla in Vienna um, because that it really shows that once there's uh, these spaces are there and handed over to the inhabitants, they came up with something with great ideas how to fill these spaces, even if they are kind of very, let's say, normal spaces, not designed specifically for, for anything, um, even without natural light. But maybe this was kind of uh, so, yeah, it, 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 it sounded a little bit like, like a leftover space because they, they wanted to have these kind of terraces uh, and then there was this leftover space in in the center, and uh, but this is now so uh, valuable. I agree completely. <laughs> um, I have then the question from Aliseu, who, when you were talking about the, the projects of renovation from Lacaton Vassal and, and others, um, if is only happening uh, if you have examples of that happening also in private land, you know, if it's only done in, in social projects or if you know of some others happening in, in private land or what do you think then, if not, why is it the, that this happens? Does it need a push from the government always or? I mean, in the in, in the case of Lacatomasal, it was uh, 
uh, even not so much the the government it was really the um in in this case it was the the social housing company who took up the idea um and it was um and then it was not so much, or uh, it was not subsidized by by the state, but they said, okay, if, uh, the thing is, I, I can still, I mean, I can, the, the, these uh, spaces need renovation anyway. I have to invest, of course, people have to, I mean, they, they, these kind of housing uh, companies, they have to invest in, in, their, in their housing and, and need to renovate them. And uh, so I can also just, but I have all the people who live there, and if they don't have to move out and they pay their rent, uh, I can use this money they they pay pay for the rent to um, get a get a um, <clears throat> a loan and um, and pay for this uh, renovation. So, but yeah, I I mean, Lacan and Marcel, they are proposing this uh, for quite some time now, and I I'm always. Also, I think it's a little bit, uh, and they prove it's 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 uh, it works, and um, I think there it could be done way more often. But maybe with the Pritzka now, they they get a little bit more uh, power and a little bit more people kind of may think, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. <laughs> I hope so. Hopefully. <laughs> Um, I have another question related to on because in the in the exhibition you cover many different countries. So what role do you think it plays both uh, regulations if in some cases it's limiting this uh, collective uh, living and also the the cultural aspect? No, because this mm. is something that we hear many times here in Spain when when we show projects uh, and obviously they come from northern or central Europe and and people sometimes think it's something from a Nordic uh, countries, no, but you showed from Japan, from many other cultures and societies. So what do you think is the, the role of culture and, and regulations on the other side? Mm -hmm. I, I think there is a cultural aspect, uh, of course, to that. Um, I think Japan, um, is probably um, there. There are a couple of projects uh, from Japan, and I think there it really works because they are used. They, they are so limited in terms of space because um, there's these kind of very small spaces in Japan, um, very small houses. It's it's kind of tradition. So you really have to build a very in a very intelligent way and and kind of sharing spaces is a very intelligent way to make most of what you have. Um, so I guess that's why it, it's also kind of popular in Japan. Um, it, sometimes it's about, but it's also this kind of, uh, yeah, that you have to to see it at some point and, and visit a project and, and get, get the idea of, or, okay, that's, Actually, it's not so. Uh, let's say I think a lot of people are a bit afraid that they have to then share and discuss everything with everyone, so they are very concerned uh, maybe about their privacy. But for example, if you if you then visit one of those projects uh, with these kind of cluster apartment, you see okay, there's always the option of privacy and. Um, it's it's nothing that is forced upon you, but yeah. So I think that there there is a cultural uh, uh, thing, but it's also, I mean, you you did this too, and uh, I think it's it, it's also something that needs to be kind of. The more it's done, the more people see it, the more people will kind of. Uh, think, OK, yeah, it actually works and, and it, it can also become part of our culture. Um, in terms of regulations, I think there are uh, some, for example, in Switzerland, it's, it's like in Zurich, especially 
where a lot of those projects were realized, it's uh, the city really understood that it's good for the city to um, to help those these projects, also because it's a very high price uh, city, um, Zurich, and especially when you work with uh, cooperatives, it's a way to um, keep um, rents low and uh, to to take these kind of uh, off the market. Because with a cooperative, uh, you you can sell your apartment. It, it doesn't become a commodity. It's really, it's really there to to use it and uh, for for a, a decent price. Um, you can't be thrown out. So I think cities are kind of, especially with high where their prices explode, housing prices. They understand that uh, doing. Um, um, supporting cooperative is really good for the city because otherwise uh, we don't have an inclusive city anymore and only the uh, the rich can live in the city and everything everybody else is pushed out and we know that this is not a good development. Each city needs uh, really a kind of diversity of people and um, and this is of course uh, the role of, of, of politics to, to make sure that this is still possible. Thank you. Uh, uh, I wanted to remind the people who are still watching in the YouTube that they can make the questions. We have time for a couple of more questions. So while you think on one, I wanted to ask one myself. Because um, we are also, this, this cycle of sessions is held by the Architects Association, so maybe we can make one question related to the professionals and the role of professionals. If you've seen in these projects, especially the the recent ones, but maybe also in the in the historical ones, uh, if there's been a, a, any special role from the professionals, no? If if uh, this is something that it's uh, always needed, or just sometimes any professional is engage on this type of projects or uh, if, if there's if you've seen any pattern or none at all <laughs> <laughs> mm, I don't know I, I mean I haven't really uh, checked that kind of uh, what kind of professionals are, are doing these kind of projects but of course it's it's people who are um, who in the end I think any architect should be able to design this these kind of uh, collective housing. I mean, that's what architects are able to do. They 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 can they they can turn concepts of how people live together into space and make connections and and come up with ideas. And um, so, but of course, uh, I guess people who are um, it's uh, these kind of social, social moment is, is important. So I think it's architects that are interested in, in these kind of relationships between people and how can we foster collectivity? How can we make a design that is really inclusive and where people can meet and nobody feels excluded and, and this kind of ideas. But um, and many of the projects I showed are, are also yeah, young architects that um, often then moved into these projects themselves. <laughs> and uh, for example, in, in, in Switzerland, many of the people who founded these kind of new um, cooperatives, uh, they were really in the, in the 80s, they were these people who would go on the street and fight for for more spaces for affordable housing and, and so on and they would squat uh, houses and now they uh, develop houses yeah that's that's always a thing not the architects moving to their own projects uh, let me see because i have people in the chat also telling me questions um, Maybe one uh, difficult question always, which is, um, what do you think is the, the future for this type of projects, or what 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 are your feelings that is going to happen 
with this kind of projects? Is it something that's going to spread? Uh, or is it just now the momentum? Or what, what's what's the future for that? I, I think uh, it, it will spread. I think that it has a great future um, because, I mean, first of all, because this kind of traditional family model is not kind of, it's, it's getting, uh, yeah, it's getting rare, and and especially through the pandemic, I have the feeling we really um, felt how important these kind of social contact is for us, and for for many people who that uh, kind of live on their own, like in, a, in single apartments, um, it was really, really, really terrible to kind of not be able to move out, to not have contact. And I think this is really something where we kind of said, oh my God, no, it's it's really important that we have these kind of, uh, uh, these, our, our kind of communities are becoming more important. It's also when we think that we will do more and more work from home. Um, also after, not only now during the pandemic, but probably also after the pandemic. Um, I'm, I think that this kind of working from home will become more important. So uh, we will need, uh, then we will have need these kind of spaces where we can also work and live, where, where this kind of comes together. And, um, and also if the, the office or the workplace as a social uh, at a space as a social space where we meet other people is becoming less important then that means the the people with whom we live together are becoming more and more important so that we can have this kind of social exchange so i think it's uh these are all the reasons that that thing i think uh make totally sense to to, to go more to um these kind of shared facilities plus um Still, there's uh, a lot of people. I mean, if if we reduce the the private space and enlarge the collective space, in the end, we we use less uh, resources. We lose we, we use less space, which is also from an ecological point of view very important. That we kind of um, <clears throat> um, don't don't uh, produce so much emissions or waste. And we can also provide by 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 doing this, we can provide more people a home in in the cities, um, which is important too. And so I think there's uh, I see there. I mean, I'm optimistic, and I think it's a great uh, way to, of of solving some of our um, problems we we have uh, these these days. <laughs> Plus, uh, we have. Um, also, in at least in our kind of Western uh, European uh, communities, we have an aging population, and uh, I get a lot of feedback from, especially also elderly people, um, who say that it's, it's it's for them it's it's very nice to to have this kind of um, yeah th this kind of community um, when they. Uh, when they grow older and to to support each other and uh, that's that's very nice too so yeah i'm very optimistic <laughs> thank you Ilka. um yeah i think we can we can leave it here because it's late for you and also you can see from the people who's already like been one hour and a half in the, in yeah, the presentation it's, it's maybe yeah, too much <laughs> Online is always really, I mean, it's different when you're <laughs> listening to lectures. So, so thanks for, for um, yeah, for, for staying tuned for so long. And uh, sorry for my voice at some point <laughs> that wouldn't work anymore, but uh, yeah. No, and, we make it. And uh, <laughs> we also wanted to not like mention that uh, from the exhibition and the book, we thought it was very interesting to see the, the historical cases and the recent cases. And even in, you could see that in the collective models, you know how also it's a collective project. Not all these projects, they are not the, the 
great ideas of one person, but it's always there's yeah. communities and, and different uh, people, professionals or not, that are uh, pushing for, for these innovations in social sustainability aspects, economical aspects. Uh, no? So um, I think it, it was also very well uh, shown in, in, in the exhibition and in the book where mm -hmm. all these diagrams and, and even the photographies, no, it's it's not always the case that you have photographies of architecture with a lot of people <laughs> in the one house. So you could see that. Thank so, you very much. Thank you, uh, Ilka, and thank you to the people who join us uh, today and the ones that you will see it later, probably. Uh, just let me remind everyone that uh, we have three more lectures, one every week, the two next in Catalan, but the last one 25th of uh, 15th of April, sorry, in English and all the information in the Colegio de Arquitectas website. And you can still also see the exhibition in the Colegio until the 15th of April. So thank you, Ilkan. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. See you soon.